Hey guys, welcome to section 4.1. In this section, we'll talk about exponent properties. Let's get started. So before we start with properties of exponents, it's very important to understand the notation that we use or what it means for something to have an exponent. So we read this expression as m raised to p or m to the power of p. This is not ever to be read as mp. So a lot of times you'll see perhaps an x here where the m is and maybe a two in the power. So that is not to be read as x2, it's x squared or x raised to two or x to the power of two. Those are all appropriate ways of talking about exponents. So before we again talk about the properties themselves, the thing that's written at eye level is always known as the base and it can be anything other than zero. And later on, perhaps in class, we'll talk about why this restriction is in place here. The thing that's not at eye level, this expression, it could either be a number, it could be a variable, the, the power could be anything, it could be a whole bunch of terms as well. So this is known as the exponent or the power, this is known as the base. So a couple of basic facts that we should remember going forward. The first one is anything except for zero to the power of zero. So anything raised to the power of zero, except for zero itself, is one. An example of that is five raised to the zeroth power is one, seven to the zero is one, three fourth to the zero is one, square root of pi raised to the zeroth power is one. So anything except for zero, raised to the zeroth power is going to be one. Now here, I really should have written, be careful of negatives and parentheses or a lack thereof, but these are simple mistakes that you guys should be avoiding. Notice the difference between these two problems is that the negative is not attached to the five. If you remember order of operations, exponents have to be resolved before multiplication. So a negative five fundamentally is just negative one times five. So what this is saying is, hey, raise five to the zeroth power, and whatever answer you get with that, multiply that by a negative one. So because five raised to the zero is one, when we multiply that by a negative, that gives us negative one. By contrast here, the negative five in entirety as a package is getting raised to the zeroth power. So that's why this whole thing because it's being raised to the zero, gives us one. Next fact we should remember is that anything raised to the first power is always itself. Now here we don't really have a restriction in that the you know base could not be zero. Zero raised to the first power is zero. Five raised to the first power is five. Seven raised to the first power is seven. Three fourth raised to the first power is three fourth. Now, this is the way this property is typically, or this fact is typically introduced. I almost prefer it the other way around because this is the one going in from right to left is the direction that students find most difficult. If you just have a free floating expression or a number, if you just have five, that is the same as five raised to the one. So whenever you see a number by itself or a variable by itself, never think that it does not have a power every free floating term has a power of one. So five is the same as five to the first power. Seven is the same as seven to the first power. So remember that going the other way as well. So this direction is typically easier one to remember. Anything raised to the first power is always itself. But remember that anything is actually itself raised to the first power. So please, please, please make note of this and remember this going forward. A third fact is what an exponent actually is. So when we say two raised to the third or two to the three or two cubed, what we really mean is take this base and multiply it by itself this many number of times. So in this case, this is telling me that my base is two. So I write down two here and I have to multiply three twos by themselves. This does not mean two times three. Please make a note of this. This does not mean two times three. Exponents 
imply multiplication, but not of the base and the power. So this will never mean, uh, looking at this example, this will never mean negative four times five. This is a very compact notation for, hey, take negative four and multiply it by itself five times. So here's the first rule of exponents that we'll talk about in this section. It's called the product rule. So we'll motivate it by, we'll actually motivate all the rules in this section by examples, and then you guys get to fill in some blanks. So let's say we have two to the third times two to the fifth. What that means is, hey, I have three of these twos that I want you guys to multiply. So I have three terms here, two times two times two. That's by the definition of exponents. Two to the fifth or two to the five power means that I want you guys to multiply two by itself five times. So that's why we have five terms here. Now, if you notice, because all of these twos are being multiplied, we can actually multiply all of them together. And if we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this in shorthand notation or condensed notation could be turned into two to the eighth power because there's three of them here and five of them here. And if we count all of them, this gives us eight of them. Now, these properties are not just for numbers or for variables. They, they apply to uh, any generic sense. So instead of talking about numbers, if we change to variables, if we have x to the third times x to the fourth, that means this notation is telling me take x and multiply it by itself three times. One, two, three. Then take this base, whatever that base happens to be, and multiply it by itself the power number of times. So x times x times x times x. There's four of them. So if I were to start counting all the x's I have because I'm multiplying all of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is saying that take x and multiply it by itself seven times. A shorthand notation instead of writing out seven x's is simply x to the seventh. So now a couple of motivating questions. How does one go from two to the third times two to the fifth to two to the eighth directly? Similarly, if you start with x to the third and x to the fourth being multiplied, how do you get to x to the seventh directly? So for class, what I want you to do is whenever you see these rules, I've left some blanks in front of them. So on a separate sheet of paper, what I would like for you to do is write down product rule, write out this beginning portion, and then fill in the blank with what you think needs to be done. So if you have two to the third times two to the fifth, and you're getting to two to the eighth, how do you think that that's happening? So just to prime this, there's two conditions that need to be satisfied for the product rule to be used. The bases need to be the same. So when bases are the same, and, and implies that both conditions must, must be true, not just one of them, but both of them. And the terms are being multiplied. So what happens if the bases are same, but the terms are not being multiplied? Well, then the product rule doesn't apply or doesn't work. It might be that some other rule works, but the product rule does not in that case. So when the bases are the same, base is the same, base is the same, base is the same, base is the same, and the terms are being multiplied, multiplication, multiplication, what should you do to get the answer? So fill in the blank. Uh, come up with your own sentence, but what I want you to do is be very, very specific. Uh, I'll collect this sheet at the beginning of each class, and then your attendance will be based on you turning in this sheet. So write down product rule, write down this sentence, and then finish it with something that makes sense with the examples that you were given, but be specific. Next thing we have is quotient rule of exponents. So product rule seem to work well with, well, products. Quotient rule hopefully doesn't take too big of a leap of faith to say, what's well, gonna work with quotients? So if you have two raised to the eighth divided by two to the fifth, what that means is I have eight twos that I need to multiply by themselves. So I have eight of them on top and two to the fifth implies that I have five of them on the bottom. 
Now, if you notice, this two can cancel with this two, this two can cancel with this two, or five of these twos can cancel with five of them on the bottom, leaving behind three of the orange twos on top. So I have two times two times two. And again, if we were to use shorthand notation, we can rewrite this as two to the third. In this section, at the very least, I'm going to want you to write things as exponents so you start practicing writing it things in exponential notation. Do not multiply these twos out. So I don't want you to write two times two is four, four times two is eight. The purpose of this section is to get you to see how this is very condensed notation. What happens if we expand it and then condense it back again? So answers such as two raised to the third are perfectly fine. They do not need to be quote unquote simplified. In fact, I might take off points if you decide to do that, especially if it's in the exponent, so, uh, exponents section. Moving on to the next example, if we have x to the seventh over x squared, x to the seventh implies that there's seven x's being multiplied by each other. x squared implies that there's two of them. So again, two of the ones on the bottom can cancel with two, any two on top. I only canceled these ones on the right, but I could have canceled this one and this one. Or I could have canceled the first and the second to last, or I could cancel the, the second one and the fourth one. So it doesn't matter which ones I, I cancel, these are all being multiplied, so I'm allowed to do that. You'll notice that I have five x's left on top. So if I write those five out, I can see that shorthand notation for writing this is x to the fifth. So the questions are the same. How does one go from here to two to the third directly? How does one go from this example to two to the fifth directly? So hopefully you you're starting to observe some patterns between these numbers. So again, under product rule in your sheet of paper, write quotient rule. And these two conditions, again, when bases are same, so x, x, 2, 2, the bases must be the same, and the terms are being divided. So you have a quotient here and a quotient here. Then how or what do you, how do you get the answer or what do you do in order to get to this directly? Again, I'd like for you guys to be very, very specific in what you write. The third rule for exponents is the power rule of exponents. This applies whenever you have a power raised to another power. So if you have two to the third, the whole quantity squared. Well, two to the third really means two times two times two. And whenever I square something, that means whatever this quantity is that I'm squaring, I want us to multiply it by itself. So instead of writing two times two times two squared, what I could write is two times two times two, which is right here, and then multiply it by itself. Now again, once I write things out all the way through, I can see that I have one, two, three, four, five, six twos, and all of them are being multiplied. So shorthand notation for that would be two raised to the sixth. This means that I want you to multiply two by itself six times. That's exactly what we have here. Similarly, if we have x to the fourth, the quantity cubed, or x to the fourth, the quantity raised to the third, what that means is take the inside, write it all out, so I have four x's here, and then when I cube the whole thing, I have to take this expression inside the parentheses and multiply it by itself three times. So I have x times x times x times x, the same thing, twice more. And now if I start counting all of these, I'll have 12 x's that are all being multiplied so I can condense this into exponential notation and write x to the 12th. And lastly, I urge you to look at this example. I just wanted to throw in a, a little curveball to say that, hey, fractions are gonna tend to freak people out, but it works the same exact way. So if you have three over four, the quantity squared, the whole quantity to the third power. This inside red portion just means take three over four and multiply it by itself. Once you've done that, the cube on the outside means whatever's inside the set of parentheses, multiply it by itself three times. And once you've written all these expressions out, what you can do is you can see one, two, three, four, five, six of these terms. So eventually I can condense it all into three over four raised to the sixth power. Again, the same questions as before. In order to answer this question, think about these two questions. 
How does one go from this expression to this expression? How does one go from here to here directly? The reason we, we want to do this is because if this were 40 and this were 30, it would be quite annoying to write out 40 x's and then write them down 30 more times and then start counting the answers. So that's why we come up with these rules so we have a faster way or a more efficient way of saying, well, if this is what we have, instead of unpacking it and then repacking it as a, as a simpler answer, how do we go from here to here directly? So the power rule underneath the product and the quotient, the third rule that we're going to talk about is the power rule. And the rule states that when raising a power to another power, what should you do in order to go from here to here directly? Again, as always, be specific in your thoughts. We have a couple more rules to go. So a product to a power rule. This means you have a product of two or more things. And then there's a power on the outside. So you have a product raised to a power rule. You have a product of multiple terms being raised to an exponent or raised to a power. So if you have x times y raised to the fifth, what that means is that I have to multiply this by itself five times. So I can write down x times y five times. Now, once all the exponents are gone, I can start looking at how many x's I have. So I have one, two, three, four, five. And just the x's alone, what I can do is I can rewrite them as x to the fifth because there's five of them being multiplied by themselves. Same thing applies for y's as well. The y also that gets condensed to y to the fifth. If you have two times one over seven raised to the third, that just means I want you guys to multiply two times one over seven three times. And once the exponents are gone, we can see that you have a two, a two, a two. Each one of these is getting multiplied. So you get two raised to the third because there's three of them. Similarly, one seventh raised to the third. Finally, I didn't want you guys to think that the product only works, the product to a power rule only works with two terms. It doesn't matter how many terms you have. So I could have done this as PQRST squared. All that would require me to do is write PQRST times PQRST. And then if I were to start counting the individual variables, I have P times P, which is P squared. And then I would have Q times Q, which is Q squared, R times R, R squared, S times S, T times T. So again, same exact questions as before. How do you think we go from here to here? Or from PQR the quantity squared to P squared, Q squared, R squared? What patterns do you observe here? What do you think is happening? So the product to a power rule can be introduced as when raising a product of multiple terms to a power, we should do this. Again, fill in the blank, bring it to class on that sheet of paper. The quotient to a power rule is the next one. So here we have a quotient of two terms. Instead of having a product of two terms, it's the same exact rule except for instead of having a product, we have a quotient. So we have x over y raised to the third. The third power implies that I'm multiplying this by itself three times. And once I've gotten rid of the exponents, I can see that I have one, two, three x's being multiplied by themselves. So I can condense that into x to the third. Similarly, I have y times y times y. That's the same as y to the third. If we have two thirds, so it's not just with variables. If you have numbers only, two raised to the third, two over three raised to the fourth power, you can write two thirds, two thirds, two thirds, two thirds, the power number of times being multiplied. And then we can see that there's four twos on top all being multiplied. So I can condense that into two raised to the fourth. I have four threes being multiplied in the denominator. So I can condense that to three raised to the fourth or three to the four power. Finally, P over Q, the quantity squared is just P over Q times P over Q. You're just writing the base this many number of times and multiplying itself. P times P is P squared. Q times Q is Q squared. So hopefully you at least know what these questions mean at this stage or why we're asking them. So if we have x over y, the quantity raised to the third power, 
how is it that we can go directly from here to here without having to write all that stuff in the middle? How does one go from here directly to here without having to write all that stuff in the middle? So we have a quotient to a power rule. Earlier we had a product to a power rule. This one is a quotient. So when raising a quotient of multiple terms to a power, what should we do? How is it that we're going from here to here? How is it that we're going from here to here? Never, ever, 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 ever do what I'm about to show you. This is a cardinal sin in mathematics. Never, ever, 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 ever do this. Never distribute a power over a sum or a difference. So if you notice, we'll come back here for a second. We have a product of two terms or mul multiple terms with a power on the outside. This has a rule. If we have a quotient of two terms, two terms, two terms, as, or as many terms as you like, with a power raised on the outside, we can distribute the power uh, or we can write it out three terms. So there is a rule that applies to qu quotients and products raised to a power. There is no rule that goes from here to here. These two things are not equal to each other. This is a very, very common mistake. Please make sure you don't make this. So x plus y, the quantity squared, is not the same as x squared plus y squared. If you memorized your formulas, hopefully you know why that's the case. x plus y, the quantity squared, is not x squared plus y squared. Same thing with the subtraction as well. If you have x minus y, the quantity to the sixth, that is not the same as x to the sixth minus y to the sixth. Lastly, just to drive the point home, a plus b, the quantity squared, is not the same as a squared plus b squared. Never, ever, 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 ever do this. Never, ever split powers over sums or differences. This is a cardinal or an unforgivable sin in mathematics. Do not do this. It is illegal to do that in math. The last rule that we'll talk about is the negative power rule. And in this one, I put a star next to this because I'm actually giving you guys this rule. Uh, instead of perhaps having you guys struggle with it, I'm giving you a rule so that maybe you can use this to go back and say, oh, this is the kind of detail that goes into making up a rule. So I'm going to use informal language because that tends to stick with students the best. When moving terms from top to bottom, and from top to bottom, I mean about a fraction. So there's a numerator to the fraction. I'm going to call that the top. There's a denominator of a fraction. I will call that the bottom. Or if you're moving terms from bottom to top, it doesn't matter which direction the terms are moving in or going to. The sign on the power changes. Notice I did not say the sign on the term. The sign on the term does not change. It's only the sign on the power. So let's see a whole bunch of examples of this. I have a fraction. I have a term on top. I have a term on the bottom. Now, if I wanted to take this term that's on the bottom and move it to the top, the sign on the exponent or the sign on the power has to flip, has to change. So the 10 is not moving anywhere, so the 10 just stays where it is. If I take the x to the negative 3 and move it up top, it'll go next to the 10. And when it moves up, this negative 3 will flip to a positive 3. Notice that the sign on the x or the 10 did not change. It was only the sign on the exponent. Another example, if you have 1 over 10x to the negative 3, Notice that I'm only moving the term that has the exponent with it to the top. The 10 stays on the bottom. The 10 does not move. So if I were to take the x to the negative 3 to the numerator, the negative 3 would turn into a positive 3. The x stayed positive. The 10 stayed positive. And if you're wondering, well, what happened to the 1? When this x to the negative 3 moves to the top, it becomes 1 times x to the positive 3. And that's the same as just x to the positive 3. In this case, we have 1 over, now pay attention to the parentheses. In this example, I did not have any parentheses. This meant that this power only applies 
to what's right next to it in the base. This, on the other hand, means that this negative 3 applies to this entire term. That's why we use parentheses. So if I were to take this entire term from bottom to top, the sign on the 3 is going to change. Now again, if you're wondering, well, what happened to the 1? 1 times 10x to the positive 3 is just going to be the quantity 10x raised to the third power. Another example, if you have 4 thirds x to the negative 7, notice that I'm not touching the 4. Notice that I'm not touching the 3. The only thing that has a negative exponent is the x. So if I move the x to the negative 7 to the bottom, it will become x to the positive 7. Notice none of the other terms move. They stayed exactly as they were. This rule is not just for variables. It applies to numbers as well. So here's where students often make uh, their first mistake, uh, perhaps on a midterm, because this is an easy question, but true or false, 4 over 3 is the same as 3 to the negative 1 over 4 to the negative 1. This is actually true, because remember that when I said at the beginning of, the, of, the talk, of this talk, remember that any number by itself always has an exponent of 1. So 4 is the same as 4 to the 1. 3 is the same as 3 to the 1. So if I were to take the 4 to the positive 1 and move it to the bottom, the sign on the power is going to change from positive to negative. I have a 3 to the positive 1. If I were to move it to the numerator, it would turn into 3 to the negative 1. Now, this is not to say that you have to do this. This is just me trying to tell you all the different nooks and crannies where problems can come from. So very rarely will you take 4 over 3 and turn it into 3 to the negative 1 over 4 to the negative 1. In fact, I might not have ever seen that happen. But if, for instance, I give you an easy true or false question that says, is this equal to this? Yes or no. Or true or false, this is equal to this. Um, yet another way of asking the question is write, all, write your answer with only negative exponents. So if you notice here, all the exponents are positive. The 1 rarely gets written. The 1 rarely gets written. But if the question forces us to give our answer in negative exponents only, you would need to turn it into this. Let's do another one. So if we have 10x to the negative 3 over y to the negative 5, the 10 doesn't have an exponent, so I'm not going to move that or touch it. The 10 just stays there. I have x to the negative 3. So if I were to move this from top to bottom, it would turn into x raised to the positive 3 because it's negative currently, so when it moves to the bottom, it becomes positive. I have y to the negative 5 on the bottom. So when I move this to the top, it becomes y to the positive 5. Again, the 10 did not get touched. It never moved. It's, it was on top to begin with. It's still on top. Last couple of examples. If we have 3 to the negative 1 over 4 to the negative 1, and the question were to say, give all your exponents, or give your answer with only positive exponents. Well, then this would be unacceptable because this has negative exponents inside of it. So if I have three to the negative one and I were to move the three back to the bottom, it would turn into three to the positive one. And anything to the first power is itself, so we just write three here. Four to the negative one, if we were to move it to the numerator, would turn into four to the positive one and four to the first power is just four. A couple other variations. If the question requires you to give your answer in negative exponents, well, if you have five squared over seven cubed, or five to the second power over seven to the third power, and the question says rewrite this expression or rewrite your answer with only negative exponents, all the terms that have a positive exponent need to move to the other side. So the 5 squared is on top. So if I move it to the bottom, it becomes 5 to the negative 2. Again, whenever you move a term from top to bottom or bottom to top, the sign on the power changes. So this 7 to the positive 3 turns into 7 to the negative 3 when it goes to top. Finally, if we have x to the 4th over y to the 7th, and again, let's say the question requires us to find uh, or represent our answers with positive exponents only, well, then you stop here. You're done. 
However, if the question specifically states to give your answer in negative exponents, well, x to the 4 would need to move to the bottom and become x to the negative 4, and y to the 7th would need to move to the top to become y to the negative 7. A common misconception at this stage is students think that, well, you cannot have negative exponents on the bottom. I'm not sure where that ever came from, but it really depends on the preference of the solution writer or the question writer. So by convention and by tradition, we always leave our answers with positive exponents only. That's not to say that this is not possible or that this is incorrect. So if you're writing a textbook or if you're writing a journal article or a paper, by tradition and by convention, we always would use positive exponents. But sometimes, in, especially in science, in physics, chemistry, and biology, when we're doing computations, it becomes almost easier to do the computations with negative exponents as opposed to positive ones. So that's why students that are taking this class, at least with me, should be comfortable changing from positive exponents to negative exponents and vice versa based on the requirements of the question. Please remember to bring a sheet of paper with all the questions uh, and all the rules from earlier in this talk to class. I'll mark your attendance based on it. That's it. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Have a nice day.